And so what I want to do right now is I want to have Therese Hill come up, and Randall, you can come up as well. And Therese had a vision um, a couple weeks ago when I preached on the days of Noah, is Therese had a vision that went right along with the message I was going to preach. And so I want, uh, I want to ask Therese to share that. It was, it was pretty amazing. She did not know what I was going to be talking. Oh, I got it right here, Therese. Uh, yeah. So she's looking for the microphone. So it is right here. And uh, come on up. No, stay up here. Come up here. Oh, well, you got this. People got to see you. Yeah, um, I love this. Yeah. Okay. So. Couldn't get out of this one. Um, so just to give you a little background before I start, the Lord always uses our family as a picture of what's going on in the church. Yay, us. Um, so just to kind of give you a little history, Randall and I got married 31 years ago, so that's the beginning of the church, um, the bride and the groom starting the church. And then we had four children, and each child has been such a picture of what's going on in the church. And I'll just give you a quick glimpse. Dylan uh, was the plumb line child. Uh, he was born, and his name does mean uh, faithful and true to my beliefs. And Daniel was Daniel Elijah. You can guess what we were talking about during that time. Yes, we were talking about Jezebel. And so, and then it goes on. I can tell you the story if you want to sit down and talk. But so, our children have always been a picture, and once the last one was born, I thought, oh, we're done. It's time for the Kesslers to take over. Um, but now, as you all know, three of, our ch three of the four are getting married. And uh, yay, we will put a GoFundMe page up as soon as we finish. Um, just joking. Um, so two Sundays ago during the praise and worship, it was just a beautiful time. The Lord just, you know, the first part was just how he was just loving on us and that he loves us. And it's just like, Jesus loves me, this I know. And I think the Lord just pressed upon me that we've got to know that Jesus loves us no matter what, because some storms are coming and it's not always that good feely time, even like with a marriage, you know, but I know that he loves me. And I think that's where we got to come to a point where we know that Jesus loves us, even when some storms are coming. So the picture I had, now I'll get to the story, was um, of Randall and, the Noah, and like Noah's Ark. And then all of a sudden I heard the Lord say, your three sons have taken a wife. Now, Quentin is our son. We've just taken him in as our son. <clears throat> but... He was just saying, your three sons have taken a wife, and they're getting ready, and so do you. You need to get ready. And I felt like that's for the church. We need to get ready physically, spiritually, mentally. Think about like a wedding, what we're doing when we're getting ready. We're thinking about our finances. We're thinking about, you know, getting the, the couples are coming, and they're going to get edu educated on the Lord, and, you know, they're going through deliverance, and there's so much that we do to get ready for a marriage. But I think the Lord is saying, you need to get ready you need to build the ark, and the storm is coming. And then right after that, Larry sings out, a storm is coming. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. And then Brian gets up and says the whole thing about Noah's ark. And I'm like, wow. And the children are talking about Noah's ark in the children's department. <laughs> so I thought it was just neat how it just all came together. But I really feel like he's just saying, you need to know that I love you, and you need to get ready. Let's, uh, let's, let's have Randall blow the shofar just as a, it's, it's kind of like the, the burden on my heart for this message is that we would really understand the times we live in and that we would wake up to the urgency of the hour. And I almost feel like that's something we say every Sunday, but I, I, you know, it's, I think we don't really, all of us don't really see the urgency of the hour. I want Randall to blow the shofar just as kind of a, the, the Lord's alarm is sounding, blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain that the day of the Lord is coming, surely it is near. And so, you know, the Lord's return is, is, is very much, I think, coming faster than a lot of us really realize. And so I just want you to blow the shofar and then we'll get into the message.
Amen. I want to I want to start with prayer. Just Lord, I want to ask you today, Father, that we would really get a sense of your heart today. Lord, I, I pray that today we would have the burden of your heart. Father, give us the burden of your heart today, Father. That we would know, Lord, what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church today, Lord. Lord, let us be gripped with your burden, Lord. The burden to be made ready, we pray. Lord, would you grip us? Lord, would you stir us up, Lord? Would you just cause the Spirit of God to really awaken us to that time we live in? Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, we would wake up to the hour we live in. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. So I want to turn our, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Psalms chapter 2. And you know, this is, this is a pickup of my message from a couple weeks ago, is where I talked about the end time conspiracy of Psalms chapter 2. David was writing in the tabernacle of David, and he's, you know, before the Ark of the Covenant, and he's in the glory of God, and in this context of praise and worship, the Lord gives him a incredibly accurate, obviously it's accurate because it's in the Bible, but incredibly vivid revelation of what would happen 3,000 years in advance. And so what David is writing about in Psalms chapter 2, and it was the theme of last, last message I did, is, is that there would be an end-time cabal, an end-time conspiracy, not a conspiracy theory, but a conspiracy led by the world's wealthy elite, powerful, influential, that would try to take God out of culture. And so David is writing and he says, why are the nations in an uproar? And that word uproar actually means, one of the definitions means is to conspire. And so David is talking and he's actually saying, he's prophesying that the nations would conspire. That means conspiracy. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's conspiracy fact. It's a true conspiracy that God is, has unveiled through his prophetic word. The nations are in a conspiracy and the peoples are devising a vain, a vain thing. So you get this idea of plotting and planning against the Lord. The kings of the earth, or you could say the leaders of the earth. They could be leaders in in any different facet. It could be leaders in business, leaders in industry, leaders in education, leaders in religion, leader, leadership is kings, prime ministers, CEOs, bankers, investment uh, firms, media. The kings of the earth, they take their stand and the rulers take counsel together. Notice that again, that, that conspiracy. They take counsel together. Now notice what we looked at last, last time is this Taking counsel together is against the Lord and it's against his anointed. What does that mean? It means it's the Antichrist. Not the Antichrist, but an Antichrist spirit is rising up. In other words, what we're seeing here in Psalms chapter 2 is we're seeing an end time cabal, an end time conspiracy of wealthy, powerful, elite people um, empowered by the spirit of Antichrist and they're saying, they're not actually using their, these words, but it's the language that David shows. Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Now, that is basically what they want to do is they want to take God out of culture. They want to take God out of the world. They want to remove the word of God out of the world so it's not influencing the world. So that basically people can live however they want to live. What, we're, what David is describing here is an antichrist end time movement that I believe is going to give birth to the final uh, last two antichrist kingdoms that's going to prepare the way for the Lord's second coming. And so, you know, we talked about all that. So now I want you to look at verse 4. As I, I want us to really, as we talk about this again this Sunday, I want us to really get what God's view of this is. The Lord, or, or the, this is what David wrote, he says, he who sits in the heavens, he laughs. Now he's not laughing like, you know, he thinks this is funny. He's laughing because he knows, 
He is the master chess player and he's moving the pieces of this conspiracy to work it out for his sovereign purpose for the end times. God is not moved or phased by what is taking place and we should not be either. We should not allow fear to grip our hearts. Now, I mean, we need to fear God and him alone. We should not allow fear to grip our hearts. Fear can have no place in us. We cannot fear this conspiracy. We, gotta, we must fear God and him alone. We must trust in his sovereignty and his, and his sovereignty alone. He is the one who is maneuvering everything. The Lord sits in the heavens and laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He will speak to them in his anger and he will terrify them in his fury. Now, I was, as we were worshiping, I was thinking about this is last Sunday we had the Super Bowl and the Los Angeles Rams won the Super Bowl and Cooper Cup won the MVP trophy. Now, I don't know if you heard his story, but it's pretty amazing. Um, he, he released it last after the Super Bowl. He, he said in 2019 when the Rams lost to the Patriots, that after that, uh, right, after, right after that game, Cooper Cup, had a, he's, a, he's a strong believer, he had a vision. And the Lord gave him a vision that they would be back in the Super Bowl and that he would win the MVP of the Super Bowl. And, one, and he won the MVP of the Super Bowl. But one of the things he said to me that was so, or not to me, one of the things he said that I heard, it was to me, I take it as a word, yeah, me and Cooper, we're buds, you know, uh, is one of the things he said was he said, I, after that vision, I began to operate from victory. And so that didn't mean he didn't work hard. That didn't mean he just said, God's just sovereignly going to do it. No, he put the, all the effort and the practice and he studied all this stuff. So when we talk about the end time conspiracy and we go into the detail of these things, we're, what we're seeing is we're seeing the enemy's blueprint for defeat is we're, look, we're operating from victory, not for victory, all right? So I want us to have complete confidence, the same confidence the Lord has. He sits in the heavens and he laughs, just like Cooper Cup. When he was going through all the different opponents' game plans, he was looking at this is their game plan for defeat because he was operating out of victory, from victory. So what we're going to talk about today as we talk about the rising up of this Antichrist kingdom is I don't want us in any way to have fear or a defeatist attitude or like, oh no, this is terrible. I mean, it's not going to be great, but I mean, I want us to see though, we're operating from victory. This is the blueprint of the enemy's defeat. And it's the blueprint for the, the, the victory of Jesus Christ at his second coming. Amen? Okay, so don't get your heart. We're going we're gonna to talk, talk in more detail about the rising up of this Antichrist movement in a lot more detail than we did the last Sunday. So don't allow your heart to get in defeat. Now, let me just share with you my burden. Now, for anyone that, that communicates, you know, on a regular basis or has a desire to communicate, whether it's writing, speaking, whatever, here's a... Here's a secret tip, and you don't even have to take my master course to get it, is when you're communicating is, is you've really got to drill down into the why of what you, you are communicating, is why are you speaking about this? And, and I try to do that all the time when I'm speaking, okay, why am I speaking about this? I don't want to just tell you the what and the how. I want to say, okay, why? Why is it that I'm, I'm feeling this way? You know, I've, I've had this burden on me f since the beginning of the year um, that, that this Antichrist kingdom is rising up. And so it's been my burden. And, you know, as I prepared this message, I was like, okay, Lord, why? What is my burden? What specifically is the burden I'm carrying in this? Because I don't want to just list out a bunch of information without really clarifying what the burden is that I have. And so I'm just going to share just real quick here. A few of the burdens I have is one of my burdens is, you know, and, and Dad mentioned it, I've mentioned it, is when we are waiting on the Lord at the beginning of the year, to, as what is the Lord saying as we enter 2022? One of the things the Lord spoke to Dad and myself independently is the church really needs to understand the seventh kingdom. 
We really need to understand the seventh kingdom. And a lot of people are like, what does that even mean? A lot of church does not understand this seventh kingdom that's rising up. And I'm going to explain what that is. And this message is, is we are witnessing right now the, the seventh kingdom that's going to get, that is an antichrist kingdom. It's prophesied about in scripture. We're witnessing this thing rising up. And my burden is that I look out at the landscape of the church, and my burden is is so much of the church really does not have a clue of what's, what's, what's happening, what's going on. That's my burden. And I remember I was reading uh, the book on Bonhoeffer, and I saw where Bonhoeffer, you know, when you're reading, it's, it's kind of the way I look at it. When you're reading back, when you're reading history, you can see very clearly, okay, here's where the, this thing is going. Here's where Hitler is going. How could... You know, Bonhoeffer was one of the lone voices in, German, in Germany, especially in the German church. He was one of the lone voices that said, this is evil what's rising up. Bonhoeffer was one of the very few voices that was saying, this is evil what is rising up. Most of the German church, most of the German church looked at Hitler and looked at this and said, no, this is good for Germany. This is good for Germany. And I'm saying, okay, we're seeing this very same thing repeated in history. Is now this evil is rising up and there's very few voices that are speaking out. This is evil. What's happening is evil and so much of the evangelical church is so silent, just like the German church. I remember re reading that book, thinking to myself, okay, you know, it's one of those things where you, you, you make this vow and you say, okay, I, am gonna, I resolve that I am going to be like Bonhoeffer. Okay, I am going to speak out when I see evil rising up. I am going to speak out against it. I am not going to be like the German church, most of the German church who was silent in that hour, who did not give voice to what was rising up. Most of the evangelical church is completely clueless about what's happening right now around the world. And I'm not going to be silent about that. I have to speak up. That is my burden. That is that... The church really needs to recognize what is taking place. Listen, we are living at the end of the age. And I know, I think what's happened is throughout in the last, especially in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, over the last 20, 30, 40 years, is so many people in the prophetic, or even, I don't even mean the gift of prophecy, I mean more in the, in the prophetic end time movement has said, no, this event means that Jesus is coming and 88 reasons Jesus is coming back. And it's almost like this boy who cried wolf syndrome where it's been said so often, so often, so often that when the real thing happens, the church is so dulled down, we don't even recognize what's happening. That's kind of the burden I'm coming from is this boy who cried wolf syndrome has, has so lulled the church to sleep. Well, we don't even see, no, oh, this thing is unfolding right now, right before our very eyes. And so much of the church is silent. We need Bonhoeffers who will speak up boldly about the rising up of evil. And that's what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share what is happening from that perspective is because we've got to recognize the prophetic hour that we live in. Another burden I have, another burden I have is if in fact this seventh kingdom is rising up, and I'm going to explain again, and you may not understand exactly what I mean by that language you will in this message, but if in fact this seventh kingdom is rising up, so many things about our lives could change overnight. And, I, and what Dad was speaking about last Sunday, the temptation to compromise the Word of God, the temptation to deny the name of Jesus Christ will be unlike anything Christians in the Western world have ever had to face. And that's why he, he talked last Sunday, preparing not to deny the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, these, I'm telling you, we are living when these things could just break out in a moment. We've got to be prepared that no matter the cost, no matter the price, we are not going to deny Jesus Christ. We are not going to compromise the word of God. We're not going to say there's many ways to God. We're not going to agree with universalism that says that 
there are many ways to God. There is one way to God, and it's through Jesus Christ. We are going to stand strong on the written word of God and what has been delivered to us. We're going to stand strong on that. We are not going to compromise with the word of God. We are not going to come into agreement with this, uh, this definition of sexuality that's being pushed by the media, by corporations, by government that says you must gr agree with this LGBTQ agenda. No, the word of God is what defines for us sexuality. And that is the, the definition we will cling to. We will not compromise with the, the word of God. We will not deny the name of Jesus Christ. So uh, another burden I have is that we would resist the spirit of the age. We've got to resist the spirit of the age. We cannot give into the spirit of the age based on fear, based on this desire that we want, that we have this fear, or we want to fit in with the culture, or we want, we don't want to be categorized, or we don't want to lose, you know, whatever, whatever it would be, status, money, or whatever. We, we got to realize that the church, as we head closer to the end of the age, is going to be hated by the world. And so we've got to just say to our image and our desire to want to be liked and loved by people, we've got to go to the cross and let that die. I mean, if Jesus was hated, how much more will his disciples be? We've got to lose the fear of man, and we've got to cling to, to be that faithful witness of Jesus Christ, no matter the cost. Amen. The third burden I have is, and, and Therese expressed this, is if the Lord is indeed coming, I, I listen, I believe this might sound 88 reasons why Jesus is coming in 1988 kind of ish, you know, like I'm making a prediction. I'm not making a prediction. This is my own conviction. I believe the Lord could return in as early as 10 years, but within the next 10 to 20 years. I believe I will see the coming of Jesus Christ in my lifetime. I believe that with all my heart. I don't, I, there's many reasons why I believe that. And I, I really do believe that. Um, and so, I mean, I could be wrong, you know, there, not one person who has believed that yet has been right. So I'm not making a prediction. I'm just looking at the trajectory of everything and, and based on where we're at, based on the trends of where things are going around the world, based on the prophetic scriptures, based on the prophetic words that are coming from trusted prophetic voices, I'm looking at this and I'm seeing, okay, the Lord really could return within the next 10 to 20 years in my lifetime. Okay, I believe that. What grips me with a burden is most of the church are living as if that's not the case. You know, we, you know, Jesus talked about, he said, in the days of Noah, they will be eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, buying and selling, building and planting. And I, th I thought what dad said last Sunday was so wise, was, and I, it's kind of a, a little um, bunny trail here, but I thought it was so wise what dad said, as he said, listen, up until the last and I'm putting a little words into what dad said, but I'm adding to it, is up until the last three and a half years before Jesus comes back, is the world will be buying and selling, marrying and giving in marriage. Basically, we don't need to make the mistake that was made during the Jesus people movement when everyone was talking about the end times and everyone was like, it's coming, Jesus is coming any moment, any moment. And they fled to the mountains and they lost responsibility for, you know, their families or their lives or having a good job or providing. And they just got, it just got, and a lot of people came out of that really burned and they don't want to hear anything about the end times. That was a huge mistake. So I am not saying that we need to just move to the mountains and just wait for Jesus to come back. No, listen, I mean, it, up until that time, they will be marrying, giving in marriage, buying and selling. So don't be afraid that if you're hearing this message, like, you know, I, I, it's, it's weird when you speak about these things, some people will be like, oh no, I'm not going to be able to get married. Oh no, I'm not going to be able to have kids. Oh no, I'm not going to have a job or whatever your desire is. You know, the Lord doesn't want us to be overcome by that kind of a, a mentality, if that makes sense. So it's possible to both live our lives in, in, in terms of the 
being, having a blessed family, having a blessed career, you know, all these things, but also understanding the times we live in. We need to do both. We need to do both. We don't flee to the mountains and say, Jesus is coming back any moment. We will be burned by that kind of mentality. But we also don't want to be, this is really my burden, is we don't want to be lulled to sleep by business as usual. That's my burden, really. Business as usual, eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage, not recognizing the prophetic hour we live in because understanding fuels readiness. When we understand what's taking place, it fuels us, it empowers us to make ourselves ready. And so I, that's one of the reasons I'm going to today just unfold, unpack. Okay, here's, what's, here's where we are, here's what's happening, here's what's taking place, because I know the more we can understand, the more it will fuel readiness so that we will make ourselves ready. And then my fourth burden is that we would restrain the spirit of Antichrist in our nation. And I'm speaking right now from an American perspective, and I know we have people that listen to us online all over, all over the world. You need to seek the Lord for your own strategy, for your own nation. I say this from American perspective, is I don't believe, even though, God, even though America is presently under God's judgment, we are presently under God's judgment. I don't believe God is just handing us over to be destroyed. I believe God has a prophetic destiny for this nation. He founded this nation to be a refuge from the Antichrist, a refuge uh, from religious persecution, a refuge, a, a sending center of the gospel. I believe that God is, if, if the American church, if the church in America will wake up, we can fulfill our prophetic destiny. I don't believe America is meant to align with the Antichrist or the Antichrist kingdom or all this stuff that's rising up. And so there needs to be in the place of prayer and, and intercession a restraining of this from coming in to our nation. The Lord is sovereignly going to give the enemy dominion in the seventh kingdom, and, and I will um, unpack this just a little bit, in the area of, of uh, Europe and the Middle East. But, I don't, but the enemy wants more dominion than, the, than that area, so he's going to try to stretch into other areas, Canada, America. And so we've got to, in inter intercessory prayer, restrain this spirit from operating in our nation. That's part of the reason why we need to be there on, on Wednesday and Thursday in our prayer times, is we want to fight against this in prayer from coming into our nation. So my fourth burden is that we would restrain this in our nation. And we cannot just roll over and say, okay, come in and do whatever you want to do. We've got to restrain that. So I'm not going to talk about all that. In this message, I'm really concerned about about us understanding where we are, understanding what's taking place. You, you, we can't underestimate the value of understanding. Proverbs 4, 7 says, in all of your getting, get understanding. We need understanding. We need understanding of prophecy. We need understanding of how, what is taking place. We need understanding of where this is going. And so that is where we're going to come from in this message. So, I got a, a, a slide here I want to show, and it, just to kind of give us an idea of this Psalms 2 movement that is taking place. So give me one second here. I'm going to project that. Give me a thumbs up, somebody, when you can see it. Okay, anyone? No? All right. It's not there yet. Okay, we see it. All right. So... The Psalms 2 movement leads to the spirit of leads to the Antichrist. So I talked about this some last Sunday, but the Psalms 2 movement that we just read, I believe it really, really took to a new level or really began in a way we haven't seen in about 1945 after the Second World War. I won't go into the details about that. But where we are right now is where 2020 to through 2022, we're now in this phase where the elite, this cabal I've been talking about, want to bring in what is called the Great Reset. You need to be educated about the Great Reset. If you don't know what the Great Reset is, you must be educated about that. Okay. I've got, I've, I, I'm saying it again because a lot of times we just kind of roll over and think it's not relevant. This it will potentially change everything about your life, okay? 
You need to learn about the Great Reset. I've got in these notes, you can get them on RadicalPursuit.net. You can get them in the YouTube link. At, at the end of these notes, I've got some additional resources that will help you go into greater detail about the Great Reset. But you need to understand the Great Reset. Okay, what we're seeing right now in Canada, how many people have been watching what's, what's going on in Canada? That is because of the Great Reset. A lot of people are just saying, oh, it's just these truckers and they don't want the vaccine. No, this thing is about the Great Reset. That is what is happening. That same thing is coming, is already in America. And, you know, it, it is going it, to, it's, it's, we're not that much further from Canada. We've got to understand the Great Reset. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the Great Reset just a little bit in this message. But... Um, I want to encourage you, get educated about the Great Reset. It is not a conspiracy theory. This is not a conspiracy theory. Okay, this is published on the World Economic Forum's website. You can do the research yourself. This is not a conspiracy theory. They want to change uh, they want to sh uh, change free market capitalism around the entire world into this new form of cap. It's not really capitalism. It's more like fascism. But they want to change the entire global economy. Just, just to make it real simple. Do you see in Canada where if you don't agree with what the government's idea about something is, the government invokes the Emergency Act and says, we're going to freeze your bank account so that finances can't flow. That's the kind of control the Great Reset wants to have in your finances. I'm telling you, this is, this is real. This is not a conspiracy theory. Do the research. Do the research for yourself. Get educated about the Great Reset. I guess, for me, I am burdened about this so much because I, being a student of end-time prophecy is, to me, the Great Reset is leading the way to what I call the seventh kingdom, a word scripture calls the seventh kingdom. And I see it. I, I see exactly what is happening in their blueprint and what they want to do. I see it leading to this seventh kingdom, this global government, a one world religion, a one world government, a one world economy. That is where they're moving towards and what they want to do. And it is penetrated into most every single Western world's government. They have penetrated deep into that, just like in Canada. Justin Trudeau has, has been groomed by the World Economic Forum. This is not a conspiracy theory. It is, is out in the open. They have said this openly, been groomed by the World Economic Forum to be this global leader. And so basically you see they want to, if, if the people don't agree with the government, they then call the Emergency Act and say, we're going to exert control over you. That is what this Great Reset wants to do. Don't buy in to all the, the language and the marketing terms. And it's propaganda. We're living in an age of propaganda. And, and just, just study the, the propaganda that was pushed by, the Nazi Germ by Nazi Germany in the 30s and 40s. That same kind of propaganda is spread now through our media. And listen, if, if you listen to the mainstream media, you are being brainwashed by propaganda that's coming from the government, the, the, the joining together of the government and business for this great reset. You're being brainwashed by that. Be careful what you listen to. We are in an age of propaganda. Okay, you've got to know that. I'm saying that as a pastor that has a responsibility for the souls of the people that go here. I'm saying that don't listen to the media, the mainstream media. They're telling you it's basically propaganda. It's not true. It's twisted truth. It's spin to achieve their agenda. All right? So you've got to love the truth or you're going to be deceived. So, all right. We're talking about now the seventh kingdom. The seventh kingdom. And as I go through the seventh kingdom, I'm doing this out, out of obedience to what Dad and I both felt the Lord was saying as we entered into 2022 is we must understand the seventh kingdom. Now, if you would have done your homework and if you would have done your research last time when I said you need to learn about the seventh kingdom and done through the, follow the links that I sent, if you would have done that, I wouldn't have to preach about this Sunday. But since you didn't do that, so how do you know? Well, I track your links. <laughs> Actually, I don't. 
But instead of big brother, it's big pastor. So I don't track your links. I'm just kidding. But I, I, I know you enough, and I know people enough to know they probably didn't go listen to the seventh kingdom. Uh, raise your hand if you went and listened to the seventh kingdom. I, I thought Judy might. So that, yeah, Judy, it, uh, Sue, Judy and Sue. Okay, so if it, more people besides Judy and Sue would have listened to the seventh kingdom, you wouldn't have to hear it in this message, all right? So now you got to listen to the seventh kingdom. But it's very, very important that we understand what this is about because this thing is rising up right before our very eyes. And I'm telling you, most of the church does not understand it. That's my burden. The prophetic scriptures are being unfolded right before our eyes, and most of the church is blind and ignorant to it. And just think it's just these random, uh, these random things. We just had this random virus come in, and we had this random government mandates, and they're going to go away. Life's going to go back to normal, and we're going to live like we did in 2019. That is not the truth. Prophetic, if we understand the prophetic scriptures, we will understand those things. And so as I go through and talk about the seventh kingdom, I just want to say this. My philosophy about the end times and in teaching on the end times is it is more important to be ready than to be right. It's more important to be ready than to be right. Obviously, what I'm going to tell you, I think I'm right about, or I would not share that with you. It's been carefully researched, carefully prayed over, I've, you know, many, many years of study. So what I'm sharing with you, I think is right. But I also know as you get older, you realize, okay, you know, I've been wrong enough times before that, okay, there's probably something that I'm saying that's not 100% accurate, okay? My philosophy is it is more important to be ready than to be right. You can have all of your end time doctrines perfectly nailed down and not be ready. And what good does that do you? So the purpose of this is this, this understanding is not to, so that we can, you know, quote it, and you know, probably no one would talk about it over dinner anyway these days, but it's not to fill us with knowledge, it's to motivate us to get ready. Okay, so we're talking about the seventh kingdom. Now, if you look at Dan, we won't turn here, but just if you look at Revelation 17, 9 through 11, and Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, you see in these prophetic scriptures, you see six Antichrist kingdoms that have risen up in history. These six Antichrist kingdoms have had regional dominion where God has granted them regional dominion, but they've had international influence and impact. Some of these kingdoms are Egypt, Assyria, um, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. I think I don't think I put in the exact order, but those are the six kingdoms that have risen up. Historical Antichrist kingdoms that were given a specific area of dominion in a region, but, that, but it, their influence impacted um, nations uh, that were not in their dominion. And they also historically persecuted God's people. Now, Revelation 17 tells us, 9 through 11 tells us, not only have there been six kingdoms, but there is a seventh and an eighth kingdom. As I have studied the end times, I don't believe the seventh kingdom has yet come to pass. I believe, in fact, that it, was, it is now being restored in our day. But I don't think you can look in history and say, okay, Nazi Germany was the seventh kingdom or, you know, the Ottoman Empire was the seventh kingdom or whatever. I don't think that, that you can look at that in Scripture from my study and say that. I, I, my belief is the seventh kingdom is leading to the eighth kingdom, the one Jesus Christ will destroy at his second coming. My point is, in all, saying all that, as I believe the seventh kingdom is a revived Roman Empire, corresponding with Daniel chapter 2, and the eighth kingdom will be an Antichrist kingdom for three and a half years. My, my point in saying all this is that the seventh kingdom now is rising up. I believe that the European Union that was established in 1993 is the beginning of the seventh kingdom. I don't think the European Union is the final, ultimate fulfillment of the revived Roman Empire. It's the beginning of that. So if that's true, then in 1993, if it began in 1993, then we have been living in this for about 30 years where the seventh kingdom is rising up. We're living in the days when prophecy is being fulfilled. Now, my burden is now this great reset in, in, in combination with the UN's 2030 agenda, which we'll talk about in a minute, 
is, is causing this seventh kingdom to rise up to an even greater level of power and influence. It's, I believe it's already been established, but it's now increasing. And so if you look in those notes and see those links, you can go into a lot more information about that. So we won't, we won't do that here now. But one of the things that I have seen so often as it comes to the end times is a lot of end time teachers is they lump together the seventh kingdom and the eighth kingdom. And so you can't really distinguish between two different kingdoms. And it creates a lot of confusion. A lot of people that talk about the Antichrist kingdom are only focusing on the eighth kingdom, the one that will be in place for three and a half years. But they don't talk about the one that will be in place for a few decades before Jesus comes back, before the eighth kingdom. And, and so that's why in this, these notes that I have been encouraging you to read, um, goes in and shows the distinction between the seventh and the eighth kingdom. Now, in this teaching, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go through and just walk through some of these distinctions right now. Um, here, can you, you, you guys still see that? Okay, you may not be able to read it. Um, I know Dad probably definitely can't read it. No, Dad probably can read it. He's right there. But I just want to walk through these. These are in our notes as well, just to give you an understanding of the seventh kingdom. Now, again, this is basically my, what I did to, the, to, to kind of get this is I looked at, I believe the seventh kingdom is revealed in Revelation 17 and 18. I believe when you see Revelation 17 and 18, you're seeing the seventh, you're seeing one angle of the seventh kingdom right before it's destroyed. And so I've taken these from Revelation 17 and 18 and kind of mixed it in with what, what is the trends that I see have, are happening to kind of get some of these characteristics. But just to give you an understanding here is the duration of the seventh kingdom is going to be a short time. I believe the seventh kingdom began in, in its infancy in 1993. So we're talking 30 years. It's already been in, in place. But I believe that, that this could be, you know, we, we, this could be in place for 40, 50 years, but it's a short duration. And the dominion of this kingdom is, is, is going to be in the area of Europe and the Middle East, the revived Roman Empire, but it's going to have global influence and impact. And so what we need to understand is, is that God has, is going to give dominion to the seventh kingdom but the enemy would want to push that dominion into other places where God has not given him dominion. That's where, I'm speaking to Americans, that's where we need an intercessory prayer to resist this, to restrain it, and say, not in our country is this going to come in. Okay, and so the beginning of this, I said it began in 1993, the characteristics. So the characteristics of this kingdom is a guise, it's a mask, is mask, but underneath it's evil, but it's a guise of tolerance, peace, unity, compassion, equity, and justice. And it's, 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 it's this guise, but underneath it's attempted to deceive and manipulate the nations. In fact, when John was talking about the great harlot in Revelation 18, he says, all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. All the nations were deceived by your witchcraft. So, in other words, I would rephrase that and say, all the nations were deceived by your propaganda. That's really what it means. All the nations were deceived by your propaganda. Just like Nazi Germany was deceived by the, by the, by the propaganda of the Nazi regime, regime, the nations are going to be deceived by the propaganda of the seventh kingdom. Make sure you understand that because it's going to sound really great and you're going to almost feel like, I feel like a bad person for looking at that and saying it's evil. How could it be evil to have equity? How could it be evil to have justice? How could it be evil to see that we want to take care of the world and we want to do all these great things? How can that be evil? It's propaganda. Don't fall for it. Underneath the guise of this, Push for unity and humanistic compassion and all these things that seem so great. All underneath that guise is an evil desire of the elite to gain as much money, as much power, and as much control as they want, they can get. And Satan is the one driving that. We've got to understand that. 
don't be swept away by the propaganda. I don't know if you've heard of the term gaslighting. Raise your hand if you've heard of the term gaslighting. Okay, gaslighting basically means that the pr people use propaganda to make you think what you see isn't really real. So they will, they will use this gaslighting on you to where you see this and you can see, okay, no, that is evil. What this is moving towards is evil, but they'll turn it back on you to make, make you think you're crazy for thinking it's evil. Be aware of gaslighting. Be aware of propaganda, okay? Be aware of those things. It's a guise. It's a mask. The enemy is behind it. Okay, go on your business and talk about that with your fellow co-workers and see how much you're loved by them. Actually, don't. Just if the Lord tells you to, do it, but not if he doesn't. How will this be established? It will be established by uniting the nations through prosperity. We're coming into a time, I believe, of a prosperity like we have never seen before. But it is not going to be the prosperity of free market capitalism. It's going to be the prosperity of this great reset, what I see in Revelation 18. The Lord in the revelation of Jesus Christ unveils the one world economy and it talks about the merchants of the earth, the great men of the earth became incredibly wealthy by this great harlot and the propaganda that she spews out of her mouth. We're going, to see an, we're going to see a prosperity come like we've never seen before. That's what they're moving towards right now. They, they are moving, the elite are moving towards free market capitalism, this new form of corporatism, fascism, capitalism mixed together, this hybrid, what we see in Revelation 18. You should, you should read about that. A tolerant religious system, common legislation. The next thing is religion. The great harlot is is a harlot because she's spewing out false religion. It's a government-run church, which, mean, which merges together Islam, Christianity, and Judaism into a one-world religion. And I believe, too, this one-world religion is going to integrate into it other religions, even especially the woke ideology that's being pushed of social justice and the LGBTQ agenda is going to be all woven into what's spewed out of this harlot's mouth. All of that's going to be spewed out, and it's going to be basically propaganda. And we've got to know it. The church is going to be deceived by this. That's why, G that's why the Lord says, come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people. I'm already looking at so much of the church. We've lost our prophetic discernment. And because we've lost our prophetic discernment, we're believing the propaganda that's being spewed out. Evangelical leaders, trusted ones, are being deceived even right now by the government. It's an exact repeat of what took place in Nazi Germany when much of the German church said, oh yeah, we trust Hitler, we trust what he's doing. He's, he wants to make Germany great again and rebuild our economy. And Bonhoeffer was the one warning, saying, no, this is evil. Government. This is, this is kind of one of those complicated things because the government of this, what I believe is going to be, is it, it's some kind of a hybrid. It's not really socialism. It's not really communism. But it's, it's a hybrid of socialism and fascism, corporatism, and technocracy. What I mean by that is it's this hybrid between the government merging together with corporations, and, and we're seeing that right now, which is fascism to create control over the, over the world. That's the government. The economy, again, the economy is, is some kind of a hybrid of socialism and capitalism, includes what they call inclusive capitalism or stakeholder capitalism. Now, as we, as we think about this, the goal of the elite is to gain extraordinary wealth, power, and control. If you, want to know, if you want to know how the world works, it's really, really simple. It's all about money. The love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Anything you see taking place, follow the money trail, and you will see exactly where it leads. It's, 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 the love of money is the root of all evil. 
It's about money, power, and control. So that'll make it very, very simple. You can look at it and go, okay, where's the money going? Who's getting rich by this? It's all about money, power, and control. That's the elite's goal. Satan's goal in this is he wants to intoxicate the nations. See, the woman, the harlot, makes the nations drunk. In other words, if you have seen people that have been influenced by some of the propaganda that has been spewing out over the last five to ten years, whether it's the social justice issues or the LGBTQ issues that go against the Word of God, if you've seen people who have become almost as if they're intoxicated by the propaganda, you're getting a forerunner taste of what this harlot religion is going to bring. It is, it is going to intoxicate the nations, and Satan is going to use it to try to defile the bride of Christ and keep her from being made ready. And Satan is going to use it to try to prepare the world to worship the Antichrist. I want to encourage you, read Revelation 17 and 18. Just ask the Lord for understanding. Ask the Lord for understanding. Is the, 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 the nations are going to gather together and they're going to unite themselves into a one world economy, one world religion, and one world government. Okay, that's the, that is the seventh kingdom. Okay, everyone raise your hand if you're feeling encouraged right now. Just kidding. Okay, we got to talk about it though. Okay, now we want to talk about the Great Reset. So back to our chart. is the set, This is moving towards the Seventh Kingdom. We got to talk about the Great Reset. Never in my life did I think I would go into ministry and one day I would talk about the Great Reset. <laughs> okay, but it's very important. And so... This great reset is being pioneered by the World Economic Forum under the leadership of Klaus Schwab. And this, this great reset is basically the financial economic part of this, this one world government that corresponds with the UN's 2030 agenda for global government by 2030. So remember here, remember here, Back in the beginning of 2020, before the COVID, before coronavirus hit, in 2020, I preached the message about the decade of decades. The decade of decades, and everyone's like, wow, okay, that was before COVID hit. That wasn't like, like I had an encounter with the Lord and all this stuff. I, I, I did the research of what their, their agenda is, along with some other prophetic stuff, and I'm like, this is, they are pushing for this over this next decade. What happens? Coronavirus hits, all the mandates hit, all the tyranny hits. See, I'm telling you, this stuff is really, you've got to understand this great reset to make sense of what's taking place. Otherwise, I'm looking at people and they're, they're just thinking these things are all random. They're, they're these random occurrences or whatever. No, these are being driven by the great reset. So basically, they want to take the government and businesses and merge them together and they want total control Listen, they want total control over every single thing about your life, down to how you spend your money, down to your religion, down to what you believe, down to where you live. They want you to, uh, they, they are, they're pushing and saying you will own nothing and be happy. Everything you do, this is what they want to do. Everything that you do, you will rent it and you will use it as a service and you will own nothing and you'll be happy about it. And they even want to take away your meat. That's where I draw the line and I say, that ain't happening. I mean, I think we all need to go celebrate by having a burger or steak after, after this message, but just to shove it into their face. You're not taking my meat. I'd love to see them do that down in Dallas or Tennessee or wherever. You know, that ain't going to work. They ain't going to fly if you try to take our meat. But that's where they're trying to push. I mean, total control over education, total control over government, total control over media, over every single aspect of your life, healthcare, that is their plan. It is, they want to own all the world's resources, total control. That's what they want. They, they've laid it right out there. Okay, you feeling encouraged. I mentioned this, I mentioned this, we should laugh about it. God is in control. God is in control. God looks at this and laughs, but... We've got to understand it. The, the, the World Economic Forum is part of this great reset, wants to, or not, not wants to, they already have gone, I mean, it's well, well, I mean, all the banks and all the corporations are pushing what is called the ESG social credit system. 
So you know there's a, you know there's a credit score for when you want to get a loan or when you, when you want to get a car, and they basically look at your finances and go, okay, how, how well can they pay back this money? How well can they pay back this loan? Um, will they be able to do that? They look at your financial situation to find out, can, can you pay this back? Now, what this is changing to is a social credit system, an ESG credit score. E stands for environmental. Is they want to push this idea that, the, that in 10 years, if we don't do something, climate change is going to destroy the world as we know it. The social aspect of it, social justice, is, is they want to push on their woke ideology of you've got, to, you've got to view gender and equity all this way. You've got to define sexuality the way culture defines sexuality. And if you go against it, then you are, you are basically a threat to society. And then, then governance is, is, is how your boards are made up. But a lot of that, to me, can be really boring. But what really gets me as a pastor is this S part, this, this social part. Because what I see that could very well take place is the, the world, the, the, the one, this one world economy has total control over your life. So now, if, you pre, if a pastor like me preaches on the biblical definition of sexuality or preaches that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, their artificial intelligence, like they can track it on YouTube, and all this artificial intelligence can then flag me in my social credit score, and then, therefore, I wouldn't be able to get my Social Security or my IRA or my benefits, or I would be flagged for this or that. See, they want to create total control over your life. Does that make sense? Have you ever thought about why almost overnight every single company went woke? I mean, almost overnight, pushing social justice issues. Even Hallmark pushing, you know, the, the LGBTQ agenda in their movies. I mean, it's sad. I mean, we, it's probably sad we even watch Hallmark in the first place. I mean, it's the same plot every single time, but it's like, I mean, you know, like five minutes into it, okay, he's going to marry her, and, uh, you know, and, you know, 942, this tension's going to rise up, and oh, no, they look like they're going to break up, but they're going to get back together. I don't even know why we watch it in the first place, but now they're, not, I mean, now it's really sad. It's something you could watch with your, your daughter, but now you've got to be careful because now they're, they're pushing the LGBTQ agenda. Do you ever wonder why that's happening? Do you ever wonder why all these corporations, the NBA, the NFL, all of a sudden went woke. It wasn't random. It didn't just happen. It's because of this ESG credit score. The banks and the banks and the financial institutions and the investment firms like BlackRock are basically telling these companies is that you've got to get your ES, you got to get the S part of your social credit score up or you're not going to get money from us. It's all about money. It's not just a random thing that just happened one night where they're like, okay, you know, this is going to be good for our business, like the NBA. This is going to be good for our business, so we're going to get all woke. It was actually bad for their business. But because, in terms of the, what people want, is because what, what's happening is the, the, these banks and institutions are saying, if you want money from us, you've got to get this S part of your score up. What I'm saying is, a lot of us don't even know what, why that's happening. This is why. That's what I'm saying. The Great Reset has penetrated deeply into all of the, most of the world already. Okay? So it's leading somewhere. It's leading to Revelation 17 and Revelation 18. Okay. Anyone want to leave yet? So have you been following, I mean, what's been taking place in Canada I know, I know some people have given up so much on the media that they don't even watch what's taking place in Canada, but have you been following what's taking place in Canada? Because what's taking place in Canada is what the Great Reset wants to do to every country in the Western world. Justin Trudeau was groomed by the World Economic Forum to be one of their, gover one of their new young leaders. Have you followed what's happened? Okay, so basically... The government has said, you've got to have a vaccine mandate. We, you've got to have a vaccine or you're going to be fired from your job. Listen, our, like Dad said the other week, if you want to take the vaccine, that is your own individual choice, okay? 
If you feel like that's the right decision for you, you've done the research, you've prayed about it, and you feel like the vaccine is right for you, then by all means, it's about your health. If I feel like I want to or I don't want to, that's my own individual choice. It's not, should never be mandated by the government. And so, and so this should never be an issue of, of division in the church. It's really sad, too, that this, this whole vaccine thing has become an issue of division in the church. It should not be an issue of division in the church. It is an individual health decision that you need to make before the Lord in prayer of what's best for you and your family, okay? But once the government comes in and says, now we, we're mandating that you must put something into your body that you don't want to put into your body, the, the truckers in Canada rose up and said, not over my dead body. I am not putting, and I, I just I think it's awesome, I am not putting this vaccine into my body. I don't want to do it. If, if I want to do it, I will, but I'm not going to do it because you're telling me to do it. And so, I don't know, 100,000 truckers went to, the, to Ottawa to protest, a peaceful protest, to tell the government, we don't want your vaccine mandate. Peaceful. Peaceful protest. Trudeau, you change what, what needs, you change this policy. It was a peaceful protest. Well, what happened was Trudeau started calling them all kinds of names and basically said, you're a domestic terrorist. These 100,000 truckers are domestic terrorists. We are going to freeze your bank accounts. The money that was donated through GoFundMe, we are saying, we're putting a freeze on that. You cannot get this money. We're putting a freeze on your bank account. We're going to track down all of your business, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna put you in jail, and we're going to break up this protest. Basically, overnight, Canada has shifted from a democracy to a totalitarian regime overnight. All of that is driven by the Great Reset. All of it is driven by the Great Reset. And, and don't think that just because Canada's up north that we're exempt from it. No, it's already here. It's already here. It's happening. Have you ever thought about, okay, why was Australia's response and Canada's response and Europe's response and America's response to this crisis, why was it all basically the same thing for the most part? It's not a conspiracy theory. It's being driven by a playbook, by a blueprint. I mean, you think about this is if governments can have that kind of control of your money. We're at the push of a button. If you, if you do something that the government disagrees with, where you say, I don't want to put this into my body, I don't believe in this social justice issue. I believe Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but through him. I believe that God created male and female in the beginning, and there's only two genders. I believe in God's definition of sexuality. If you believe those things and the government says, well, I don't like that you believe that, I'm deeming you a domestic terrorist, therefore I'm putting pause on all of your money, that's where this is moving towards. Okay, this is not something that's coming in 10 years. It's here right now. That's what I'm trying to just sound an alarm of wake up. You know, we've got to wake up to this is not something the church has to wake up. I don't believe it is God's intention for this to come into America. I, I don't. We've got to fight against it. When I say fight, I mean fight in prayer, fight in intercession. So just to kind of give you an idea of, of where we are in, in, the, in the spectrum of, of the end times, of the end of the age, is a lot of us have been following Terry Bennett's 21-year prophecy, and we've said it over and over here, but, you know, just like Scripture says, don't despise prophetic utterance, examine everything carefully, and hold fast to what is good. Is if we're going to be a Bible-believing church, and we're going to be a church that believes in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, We've got to examine the prophetic utterances given, test it, and hold fast to what is good. I believe that his 21-year prophecy has been very, very accurate. You know, if you don't know about what happened, in 2001, he had a prophetic encounter where the Lord told him there would be three series of sevens, three series of seven-year periods. 
And this would begin in 2008. And in 2008, there would be an economic shaking that would take place. That was fulfilled with one of the greatest economic recessions since the Great Depression. And he was told, and I'm probably paraphrasing this some, but he was basically told that what would happen in 2008 would set the stage for the Antichrist economic policy. Well, now we have the Great Reset. In 2015, he was, the Lord told him that there would be governmental shaking. Okay, what did we see in America? <laughs> we have never seen, I have never, I mean, I don't think in, in dad has ever seen, I have never seen anything like what we saw in 2015 with the election of Donald Trump. All that took place. I mean, just, I'm not saying Donald Trump did everything right. By any means, he did not. But all that was exposed, all that was revealed, all that was made known, the government in America was shaken. The governments around the world were shaken so that now, towards the end of this, this period, there would be that governmental shaking. And I believe that's led to the UN's 2030 agenda, which is the blueprint for global government. So now we come to 2022. This is 2022. As Terry was told in 2022, as they would merge together, the elite would merge together Christianity, Judaism, and Islam into a one world religion. Now, I want you to see this. A lot of, so a lot of you know this, but some of you may not. This slide here is what's called the Abrahamic House of Faith. It's in the United Arab Emirates. It's slated to open in 2022. It is a worship center where there is a mosque, a church, and a synagogue, and they're basically bringing together Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. This isn't just like a random thing. This is a project pioneered by Pope Francis. Okay, this is not just like some wealthy people say, oh, we're just going to have this tiny little worship complex, you know, whatever. This is pioneered by the Pope. So whatever comes out of this, this is a, a, a clear sign that they are pushing towards one world religion. And so by 2029 is that, that all three aspects of economic, government, and religious would be in place that would be basically the B system, okay? That does not have to come to America. I'm convinced of that. I, I am convinced in the Lord this does not have to come to America is we need, through prayer, to fight against this that's trying to come into our nation. See, you can kind of see how all this is taking place. You can kind of see where this is going. In Revelation 18.23, John was shown, in this revelation of the great harlot, John was shown that, that the great merchants of the earth, that would be the bankers, that would be the CEOs. That would be business leaders. That would be those in big pharma. That would be those in the media, those in the pol political arena, those in government, presidents, prime ministers, that they, may, they became incredibly wealthy from the sensuality that was promoted by this one world religion. And I think when you understand the ESG credits, uh, credit score is you can see how this propaganda of this great harlot will be promoted to try to control the world and make these merchants wealthy. That's, that's where you can see this thing is moving. And so if you think about this, in, in the church of Thyatira, when the Lord confronted the church of Thyatira, and he said, you tolerate Jezebel. Now, what was Jezebel doing? Jezebel was coming in, and she was teaching the church, is it's okay for you to make sacrifice to idols. It's okay for you to indulge in immorality. Well, what was happening in Thyatira is they had these things called trade guilds where if you wanted to be successful in business, you had to go to these trade guilds. And in these trade guilds, you would go there and you would worship a false god and, and you had to compromise in, in, in terms of immorality and stuff like that. And basically Jezebel was coming on and saying, basically saying this, Okay, guys, I know what Scripture says, but listen, it's so, the Lord understands. He's gracious. It's okay for you to go to these things and, and eat meat sacrificed to idols. We know you're not really doing it, but you've got to take care of your family, and you've got to be blessed. And so, you know, a little bit of immorality here and there is okay. God understands the blood of Jesus covers you. And so, anyway, 
basically the, this Jezebel of the church of Thyatira was, tr- was encouraging the people in Thyatira to compromise the word of God for financial benefit. That's coming to the church in the Western world. We cannot compromise the word of God for financial benefit. Amen? We got to stand fast to the word of God. Okay. Let's end on a good note. All right? (laughs) All that I just told you, all that I just showed you is their plan for ultimate defeat. God is going to win the day. Okay? And I believe God is orchestrating the chess pieces. We do need to understand the, the enemy's plans, but, but don't be discouraged. Okay? I know you can look out and see all this stuff that's taking place and feel as if, you, you know, defeat or fear or discouraged or hopeless. I won't get married or I won't have kids or I won't, you know, have a good job or whatever. Um, I won't be blessed and have a good life or whatever. You know, all this the, the defeatist kind of stuff can come on you. And so the Lord is like, no, I am in control. I sit in the heavens and laugh. Yes, they have a plan, but they don't, their plan will not, will not come to fruition be, unless I allow whatever they want to do. The Lord is going to work out everything for our good and his glory for those who love him. So don't be discouraged. However, use it to make yourselves ready. Use it to say, this is not going to come on my watch. I'm going to stand in the place of prayer and intercession, and I am going to wage war against this plan and intercession. It's not coming here. It's not going to come here. We're going to be a voice that warns and and tells the church, tells our friends, hey, listen, this stuff's coming. Wake up. The church needs to wake up. We need to wake up. We don't need to fear. We don't need to fear this. We don't need to fear anyone but God and God alone. That's why the Lord has had us do these prophetic messages about fear God and no one else. Fear God and no one else. God sits in the heavens and laughs. God is showing us what is going to take place so that we can operate from victory instead of for victory. We can rest in God's sovereign control. Amen. So we're going to end the online. Let me actually pray real quick. I want to pray for us before we end the online. Is Father, I just pray right now. Lord, my prayer is no one would have fear. My My prayer is no one would be discouraged. Lord, my prayer is we would rise up and say, we were born for this hour. We were born for this hour. We were meant, those who know their God will display strength and take action. We were born for this very moment. I pray that that all of us here listening would have strength. I pray that all of us here would would, uh, display strength and take action. Lord, that we would display strength and take action, that we would not allow this stuff to take place in our place of influence. Lord, that whatever we can do, we would. And I pray we would have strength. I pray we would take action. Lord, my greatest prayer is that we would wake up to the urgency of the hour. Lord, let us not be asleep right now in this critical hour of history, but Lord, most important is we would make ourselves ready. For the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is at hand that we would be ready for the bridegroom when he comes. In the name of Jesus, we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. We'll end the online service here. God bless you. All right. Um, So I want to end. I want to show a video just real quick. It's like a six-minute video.